You having a great day today? I hope so. I am too. We are so blessed to be here. Uh, you have the SPL news. You can see there's a couple of announcements. I know that some of you are here because you just want to eat after today. And that's great because that's what we are about. Fun and fellowship as well as we uh, spread the joy and the hope and the love of Jesus Christ. 
Uh, we also have a council meeting coming up this coming Tuesday. If there's information, if there's an announcement, if there's something that you'd like the council to talk about, you need to contact Mark, myself, any other member of the council, let the church office know, and then maybe we can bring it up uh, coming this Tuesday. Uh, also, uh, you know, it's on there, but I want to see if we can do it. Our our guiding statement that uh, we've adopted and that uh, has come from the Holy Spirit's guidance of you and to the people. We can say it together. I'd love to do that right now. If you do not look at super, you have to look. It's on that last third of the page on the inside. We are a beacon of the community, equipping, empowering, sharing the hope and love of Jesus. Let's try that again. We are a beacon of the community, equipping, empowering, and sharing the hope and love of Jesus. And uh, so you may be thinking, well, what's going on with all of that, that ministry clarity thing? Well, it is taking place. There are things that are happening kind of behind the scenes right now. And one of the things that just recently happened was to talk about the four pillars, which are engaging, equipping, empowering, and shining. And... Uh, what uh, a team has been tasked to do is to take all the ministries that we're currently doing and put them into groupings of who's doing them, who's accountable, and are they engaging, equipping, empowering, and shining? And we go through that. And the group's been having quite the conversation. And in fact, one of the extra things that came up, there are three. One was, we used to do this in the past. The other one was a wish list. We want to we do this. And, uh, and, and the last one was, you know, kind of a vision and dream. Is there anything that we, beyond, almost beyond wishing, we'd like to see happening? And we're including that. I spoke with Tom Eggerbeck this past week, and he was excited about what he heard. And so we're still working on that. And part of that process is to move along so that we will put against our guiding statement everything that we're doing. So is it engaging, equipping, empowering, and shining? And if it is, then this is great. If there's a lacking, maybe it's just shining. And we're not getting anybody equipped both inside or equipping others on the outside, and we need to change or edit and work on that. We can do that as well. It also says, and quite honestly, if we've done it in the past, but it doesn't do any of those things, then maybe we won't do it again. It also means if we're doing something that's not fulfilling those, maybe we should stop doing it. So this is all based on what's going on with the Holy Spirit's leading St. Peter's to who is and who's to become in this community. And I want to just give you an update that it's happening. It's moving through there. So ask yourself that question when you meet with your small groups. Ask yourself that when you come to worship, are you engaging? Are you being equipped or empowered? And is something shining? Is there a shining going on? Usually worship is meant to fulfill all four of those and you know if it isn't then we need to change it work on it uh, to make sure that that takes place but that's a place where we go and of course the outline is in the back so I wanted to uh, get you going on there another part of the welcome before we break into prayer is to kind of announce and set the theme of the day so what's going on we're going to be talking about our prayers and God's plan now you know, we've got a, a great selection of people here today at the first service. We had a wonderful selection as well. And, and I can just imagine those people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and above are going, Prayer? Why do we need to have a sermon on prayer? I mean, I know how to pray. We all know how to pray, right? And uh, well, I liken it to this, this little short story. And that is when I was in, as a, uh, as a teacher, an educator, I wanted to get my master's. I thought, what do you have to do to get your master's? And you have to take this, this test, this standardized, I think it's called the GRE, if it's still called that today. And they give you, and I kid you not, a book to study. It's a monster book. And I, because I took a master's level class, loved it. And so I think this is something God wants me to do. The reason I'm telling you this is you know at the end of this short story. So I'm studying and studying and studying, and I go to take the test. And I'm taking this test. And if we're in an auditorium, there's other people taking the test, and I'm going and going, and I'm realizing something that happened all about an hour and 20 minutes into the test. I had to stop. Because I, I realized there were questions that were being asked of me. I didn't even know what the words were in the questions. And so what the, the, the punchline of this story is, the more I learned, the more I realized there's so much more to learn. 
And as I prepared for the day, there is so much more to learn about prayer. And my heartfelt prayer is that you all who have been champions of prayer will take away something and grow in your prayer walk as well. Jesus was teaching his disciples. And he says, you know, you're in a world and you're in a world that's going to be full of hardships. And he talked in parables. And the parable that was uh, shared for, for today is from Matthew 13. If you're taking notes, you may want to put a little sign there and circle it. And Matthew 13 is the one about the weeds and the weeds. You might be familiar with it. He basically said that the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. And he says, but while they were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weed seeds in the field and then went away. And as they grew up, the servants went, Master, didn't you sow good seed? And he said, yes, I did. But there's weeds coming up. He says, well, an enemy did this. What should we do? Should we pull out the weeds? He says, no, you pull out the weeds. You may pull out the wheat. Let them grow together for now. And at the end, we'll take care of it. At the end, we'll go ahead and we'll harvest all the weeds and we'll burn them in the fire. And then we'll harvest the wheat. Later on, the disciple says, what does this mean? to his master and to their master. And so he went in and he said, well, this is it. The one who sows good seeds is the son of man. That's a picture of Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons and daughters of the kingdom. And the weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. He says, when the harvest comes, the, eight, the reapers who are going to gather up are the angels. And as the weeds are gathered and burned into the fire, that will be at the end of the age. That's what's going to happen. The Son of Man will send angels, and he's going to gather those out of the kingdom. And he's going to, of course, take them. They're going to shine like the sun. Today, as we talk about our prayers and God's plans, we realize we live in a world that's full of trouble and hardship, and all creation groans under this weight. And we're not immune to that. And so that's going to be, that's setting the theme for way, the way and the reason why we need to want God's plan in our lives. So that's why we said, here is the heaven, Holy Spirit, come. We want God, the Holy Spirit, to be part of this. And now I ask that you would join me in a word of prayer. Oh God, I ask that you would rule and govern our hearts and minds this day. I ask that by the Holy Spirit that we would be mindful of what's going on in this world that we're growing up and there's things that are growing next to us that aren't according to your word. Also, Lord, make us mindful of that final judgment, that we're going to be stirred up, that we're going to pray, that we're going to live lives of holiness so that we can dwell in perfect joy together with all those who are of the kingdom of God. I pray this in the strong and precious name of Jesus. Amen. You know, if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves, we're fooling ourselves. We think, well, I'm growing next to the weeds, but I'm not a weed. Well, you and I know that we fail oftentimes under that weight and that burden, that we're still wrestling with old temptations and the old evil self. And so if we confess our sins, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And so what I'm going to ask that you and I now would join together in this time where we're saying, all right, Lord, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to confess because I know that you will listen to me. So I'm going to repeat my line again and ask you to uh, read and, and hopefully uh, talk to God from your heart to his throne. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess, gracious God, that we have grown not only because of sin in the world, but our failure to trust you for all that we need. We have not waited patiently. We have demanded reasons from you. We have sought to excuse ourselves. Yet you have given us the Spirit who intercedes for us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us to hope not in ourselves, but in the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
from corruption, the sins, your sins were taken to Christ's cross, where you were redeemed as Christ's beloved children. As a call and ordained servant of the Lord, by his authority I announce his grace to each and every one of you. In the stead, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And people said, Amen. Let's greet one another. That's the joy and peace that you have. Forgive it in Jesus. Let's do it now. I wrestling in my times, in my fears, Thank you. 
have the ch children to come up for a children's message. Come on up, guys. see anybody else I close my eyes and if I fold my hands then I'm not going to get my sister or touch my brother or or grab the cars or do anything that I'm not supposed to do so I fold my hands and close my eyes that helps me focus right so I'm only thinking of one thing yeah that, that's why we fold our hands and close our eyes you know what there are things in this world that always get us distracted don't they they always make us think of something else and it's really hard for us to pray through our prayers without thinking of something else. In fact, I'm going to tell a story about two men who had a challenge for each other about how to pray and not forget what's going on. But in the world today, we have a lot of distractions. Like right now, what did I just say? <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. So that's one of the reasons why I like to do an echo prayer. You know what an echo prayer is? An echo prayer means you have to really listen carefully and you have to say the same words that I'm saying. And if you're not paying attention, then you can't do the echo prayer, right? Yeah. So let's pray the echo, let's pray the echo prayer. Dear God, wait, hold your hands, close your eyes. Dear God, thank you for loving me and help me always to pray to you. Amen. That's it, guys. Fold your hands, close your eyes, and always keep on praying, okay? Ready to go back to your seats? Okay, you guys, go back to your seats. Here you go. You want these? So. 
So I wanted to share with you that story about distractions. Uh, today, as you can see, what our, our, our theme of the day is about prayer, our prayer and God's plan. And so uh, as I was getting ready for the day, I saw this, this, this book, and it's a really neat book. It has a lot of comments about uh, what Martin Luther said, and Martin Luther has a lot to say about prayer. And one of the stories I thought was a great illustration to begin with, especially when it had to do with distractions. Now, Martin Luther uh, believed, like you and I believe, that people who believe in Jesus are both saints and sinners. We wrestle with the world as a sinner, but we also know that our heaven is our home and we're pure through Jesus Christ. And so he had a lot of respect for those people who lived and gave their life to the Lord and his church. And this one, one story is about a man named St. Bernard that uh, he was talking about. And he said St. Bernard and this other man were having this conversation. And they were very learned men. They were men of God, men of the church, and they were talking about prayer. And the man said to St. Bernard, you know, I, I find it it's impossible to get through prayers without being distracted. And St. Bernard was kind of chastising him, like, how could you possibly be distracted? Because when your heart is right with God, you're in prayer. And he went on to say, well, look, it's not even to say the Our Father, which is the Lord's Prayer, without being distracted. And so a challenge kind of went out, and kind of a little bit of a bet. And the winner, what was out the stakes, was a, a new stallion, a beautiful horse. And so the man challenged St. Bernard to this, this challenge, says, I bet you can't even get through the Our Father without being distracted, which St. Bernard readily took up this wager. And the, the, the understanding was, you will be honest. We'll be honest with each other. So sure enough, that's what they did. As the story goes on, St. Bernard began to pray, Our Father, you know, but before he finished the first petition, he was wondering if the saddle went along with the stallion. <laughs> of course, the stallion was awarded to the other one, but it is difficult to get through prayers without distractions and life without distraction. And it kind of was the children's message, maybe you're going to take away with it. When I said, What did I just say? They go, you know, and that doesn't just, it's not just the young ones, it happens to us as well. Well, today I'm going to be using the gospel message as well as what's found in the book of Romans as our message for today. Because in the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about things that are happening in our lives that causes hardships. And Jesus said to us, if you are heavy burdened, if you are heavy, you have such heavy laden, he says, take my yoke upon you. For my burden is easy, my yoke is light. And, I, and we go to God for help. And we talk about St. Paul saying, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Because who is going to save him from this wretchedness of sin? And Paul knew it as well. Well, he went on a little bit further. And he wanted to talk about and give us a lesson about some of the things that happen in our lives. And so Paul said, you know, you're going to go through hardships, but I want you to have a good perspective of what's going on. And so in Romans chapter 8, Paul begins by saying in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. He wanted everyone that was hearing the words to understand, the right, have the right perspective on life. You know, stuff's hard. But in reality, it's not even going to compare to the joys that are before you. One illustration was of when was the last time you remember before you were born? And no one really has a, a true recollection of what, before they were born. He says, that's almost what it's like. All of your reality in heaven, and there will be that time way, way, way long ago. It'll be so great, so glorious. He goes on to say, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. And that uh, goes back to what we heard in the gospel. It's looking forward to the glory that's revealed in the sons of God. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom and the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who, have been the first, who are the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we, eagerly, uh, as we wait eagerly for the adoptions as sons, 
uh, the redemption of our bodies. In, in, in Hebrews, we, they talked about the shaking of things that will be shaken away. The things of this earth and the things that are going to stay are going to remain. I wonder if Paul maybe had this in mind as well. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope for who hopes in what is seen. But if we hope for what is not seen, we wait for it with patience. And then finally, in the last verses, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Now, having shown that all creation longs for the deliverance, and that the Christians are likewise groaning and, and under this, this difficult time, Paul now moves to state further that there's encouragement to be had. Now we have the uh, outline up there. There's no fill in the blanks. Are they in the first service? They're in the first service. All right, I got that. Okay. <coughs> They're going to follow along with the outline. It's probably good that they can see the outline. Oh, sorry about that. Are you sure they were the first service? Yes. <laughs> You know, when I was doing tape recorders, remember tape recorders? You know how those, you had to push play and record at the same time we did that. When I was younger, my brothers and sisters, we used to make up stories and we would talk about Dr. Finkelstein and his creations and his inventions and stuff like that. And no matter what, what would happen is something would happen. And we'd have to say, please stand by. Experiencing technical difficulties, please stand by. And so I think I'm gonna, so I need to come on up. Find it pretty quick. You found it. Please stand by. Does it start with nature? Drawing? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> All right. So nature groans and longs for deliverance. <laughs> we'll give you that one right away. Thank you so much. Although you and I, as Christians, we live with that knowledge of everlasting life. We know salvation is sure. I mean, we're not doubting that at all. We uh, look for that final glory of God, and yet we're always battling our weaknesses. There's always stuff going on. Weaknesses in faith, weaknesses in hope, and sometimes it's just difficulty to stand, difficult to stand firm in stuff. Stand firm on God's promises. And as a preacher, I challenge not only you, but I challenge myself. Why do we do that? God says, I'll be faithful all the time. Look at my track record. Look at all of the Old Testament, all of the New Testament. Look at every promise that was made. Everyone was fulfilled. And now I'm promising to be with you, to take care of you, to provide for you. And we're going, I don't know. Why is that? Because this is, this is the battle that's going on. We find a difficulty to stand firm. Difficult to stand firm. But now the Spirit comes to our aid. You know, we long for that coming. That's what it says. We long uh, to await and long for the coming of our Lord at the end of suffering. We wait for that. We're looking forward to that time. In fact, I had a discussion this past week. I don't know what's been going on in your, your circle of friends and the discussions you've been having, but I've been really feeling that the, the world uh, standing against God and his Bible has really just kind of risen this past week in our in our conversations in my home and with my friends and with my family. In fact, it was just it was just made really obvious that people are doing something that they've done for generations. But we've kind of put words and, and thoughts uh, to it. People are trying to find the truth for themselves. And they listen to the world 
And they, they look around and they say, well, it's, it's okay to, to do this with your body. It's okay to do this with your life. It's okay to choose this direction. It's okay to choose that direction. But then something inside them is longing for affirmation. And so they look around for affirmation. And, and one story, the names are going to be changed to protect the innocent. I'll just call them this, this lady who has a child was have a conversation with a very dear friend of mine. And this lady finally said, my church has lied for me for years. I no longer am going to my church. And I, that's a shock because, you know, this is a very Christian family. So, 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 so the thought was, so what's going on there? Well, you see, my son is transitioning. He wants to be called Hazel. And that's, and I'm affirming my son. I, she, and now we're, the pronouns change and everything else is starting to take place. My church is lying to me. They say that anybody who's doing that is sinning, and I don't believe that to be true. So I found a church that says it's okay. Amazing. Look what's just happened there. The whole paradigm has changed. You see, I establish my truth, and I make God answerable to it. The Bible no longer is to the keeper and the holder of all the truth. No. If I want to make it, make it uh, say what I want it to say, I'm going to change it, impose my truth upon it. Oh, the groans and the agony and the weight of the sin upon this world is so obvious. In fact, one person finally said, you know, this, this we know this is going to take place. Come Lord Jesus, come soon. You and I know that there's a final destination, and we still find it hard to stand firm. And so, and so we can. That's where prayer comes into play. God says, I want to have a conversation with you. Another one of the Luther illustrations was twofold. One, he said, you know, the, the pure prayer is an awesome prayer, but it happens so seldomly, like that illustration with St. Bernard. He said the, some of his things that he thinks are the purest prayers are the ones that are quick. Oh, Lord, please come now. Spirit, come now. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Thank you, God. They're, they're short, they're sweet, they're solid. There's almost no infiltration of the world and, and those kind of things. But then he went on to say, but they have the heart of prayer. And to pray as, as devoutly and sincerely by getting rid of distractions and trying to say psalm is, is truly a challenge. In fact, at the end of that illustration, the one person that challenged the other, Luther made a comment and said, in fact, if you're able to say the whole Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, without any kind of interruption or distraction, then you are a master and I want to learn under you. <laughs> Amazing it is. And so, this wonderful thing that God says, I want to be in conversation with you. I want you to speak to me. You can't overload God. He says, I'm going to give you a prayer. It's going to be a gift. Talk to me anytime. Night or day, Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you can talk to me anytime. You can never overload God with all of your talk. You can ramble on as so you want to ramble on with prayers and, and ask for intercession for other people and, and prayers of thanks and, and your mind just gets, wanders to all oh, the beautiful sunshine and thank you for the barbecue and thank you for this place being filled and thank you for people that I haven't seen for a while that are here in today's views and thank you that you're working. You can just go on. And God hears that because this wonderful gift that you have is a prayer that's offered to God and now we know that we do not we're on the next two I think we already said prayer is a gift now we're on the next one we do not pray alone we have the spirit of God well thanks be to God the divine assistance therefore is so necessary because we Christians do not always have the proper conception and the manner of how we're supposed to pray. I don't think there's anyone in this room that hasn't at one point or another, and you may be an exception, you can tell me later, that has doubted, was my prayer the right words? I don't say them as good as someone else. I hope I prayed for the right thing. 
We don't always know what's really important to us. They really, prayer sometimes, I would say, rarely measure up to exactly what the blessings that we're really asking for. And therefore, the Spirit himself comes to our assistance. He holds before our eyes the great blessing towards which all prayers of the Christians finally converge, salvation for our souls. And isn't that awesome? Salvation for our souls, reminding us that you have salvation in Jesus Christ, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and you have hope in him. And he doesn't always just only intercede for ourselves uh, in those cases, but he does for us with groanings and sighings that cannot be understood by the speech of men. And God understands, and God hears that. Our great comfort is that we have an advocate that when we say, Lord, give me what I need, the Holy Spirit in groans and signs are going, give him this. Provide her this. Offer this. And continue to offer it. God will answer it. He answers all of our prayers. So we continue to pray. And we want to pray because the purpose of prayer is to draw close to the heart of God. And that's the next one. So that our deepest desires will be those of God's and not our own. There's a Bible story, and you may want to put this in your side notes, from Acts chapter 12. I want to share part of that story with you. It's a well-known story. It's about Herod, who had arrested many Christians, and he intended to persecute them. It's Acts chapter 12. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword, and now he went after Peter. And he's going to go after Peter because he saw it as a possibility to kill the Christians and please the Jews. So this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and after arresting him, he puts him in prison. And to make sure Peter didn't escape, he guarded him with 16 soldiers, four squads, and they watched him and rotated every four hours. At all times, the guards were to be chained to Peter. He was locked in his cell. Two other guards stood guard and watch outside the cell. So from all appearances, all, all appearances, it was hopeless. Peter knew his fate. Sixteen guards. Now, switch, switch the scene to the moment and, and move to the from the locked cell of Peter to the house of John Mark, where his mother and a group of Christians were praying for Peter. Now he's in prison, and in verse 5 it says they were praying earnestly. Earnestly, that's like a, a medical term, stretching your muscles to the max. Luke writes, it's almost the same as being like an anguish, praying so hard like Jesus did in the, in the garden when, with blood and, and, and sweat mixed so hard where they were praying. The Christians were gathered there and they were not playing with prayer. They were praying fervently, earnestly on Peter's behalf. But looking at the rest of the story, I'm convinced that the people that were praying weren't actually anticipating anything would happen. Let me show you what I mean. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, he's sleeping between two soldiers bound by two chains. The sentries were standing guard outside. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appears. A light shines in his cell. He strikes Peter on the side, wakes Peter up. Mm, what? Quick, get up, he says. The chains fall off of Peter's wrists. An angel says to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. Peter does this. Wrap your cloak around you. Follow me, the angel tells him. Peter follows him out of prison. He had no idea that it was really an angel. He kind of thought he might have been having a vision. But he did what he was supposed to do. And as they passed the first and second gates... And the guards that were at the gates, the iron gate leading to the city opens by itself, and they walk through it. 
When they had walked through the length of one street, suddenly the angels left them. Now, it wasn't the skill or craftiness of Peter. That's not what got him out of jail. Peter was asleep when the angel came to him. And it wasn't sympathy of the jailers who enabled Peter to escape. They would later lose their lives over it. There's no exception, an explanation, except for the power of God working in and through the prayer. It was the power of God that sent the angels, the power of God that loosed the chains, the power of God that opened the gate, the power of God that accomplished all of this. Now, what's free? Peter. Well, what does he do? Well, he comes to his senses and he comes to a conclusion. And in, in verse 12 through 16, it says, He came to himself. He knows without a doubt that the Lord has sent angels to rescue him out of Herod's clutches. And everything that the Jewish people were anticipating was the power of God. And it dawned on him. And when it had, he goes, I I'm going to go to the house. Makes sense. So he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. And there they were gathered praying. And he knocks out the door. A servant girl named Rhoda comes over and answer. Hey, it's me, Peter. I don't know exactly what he said. She was so overjoyed, she left without opening the door. And runs back and tells them, it's Peter, he's at the door. Their response, she, you must be out of your mind. You're out of your mind. She keeps insisting that it's so, and they said, well, maybe, maybe it's an angel. <clears throat> but Peter keeps knocking, and they open the door, and they see him, and they were astonished. When Peter arrived at that house, they were still praying. They had been up all night earnestly in anguish, praying. Now, I don't know what they were praying for. We're not told whether they were praying to free Peter, whether they were Praying that Peter would remain courageous and strong and have, have strength and peace during his ordeal. We don't know if they were saying, well, maybe just don't let Herod kill Peter. We don't know what they were praying. But I really wonder if they were praying for Peter's release because they were astonished. It happened. And they didn't believe the girl when she said, he's here. What were they expecting? But he was. Something had suggested. Someone had suggested sometimes God will surprise us to show us that he's still in charge. We, we want to have the heart of God. We want to have the heart of God. We want our deepest desires to be God's and not ours. And that's really important. That's what Jesus did in the, in the, in the garden. Not my will but thine be done. Discovering and understanding God's will about your situation before praying about it sometimes is a really good bit of advice. But what if God's word doesn't specifically shine any light on what you're praying about? And so you, you kind of go on your own. Like this little boy who was caught being really naughty to his mom. And his mom sends him off to his room. You go to your room and you think about what happened. Finally he comes out. He says, I've been thinking about what I did, Mom, and I said a prayer. Well, that's fine. Did you ask God to help you to be good? No, I didn't ask God to help you to be good. I asked him to help you put up with me. <laughs> Without a daily bread a while ago. Now, we can find a, a lot of good examples about what we're talking about, especially with, with Jesus wanted not to die that horrible death, but he said, I'm going to do this. You know, and God's going to answer that little boy's prayer like he wants to answer that little boy's prayer. And you and I know there's going to be times we don't know what to pray. But if those times arise, we need to go and, and pray to God and realize that it's going to be his will. So we, we pray earnestly. As one, one author said, pray earnestly. Continue to pray in prayer, giving it to God, knowing that in thanksgiving your prayers will be heard and he will answer. It could be a quick prayer, it could be a strong prayer, it could be a medium-sized prayer, it could be prayers with others. But when we do that, unlike those that were in the situation with Peter, I think we also need to pray confidently and trustingly. Even if your experience 
And in your mind, the devil's got his foot, steps in the doorway, and you're sort of doubting the, the, the validity of how God is answering your prayers. You're wondering, even if that's happening, turn it over and say, God, I confidently trust you. I know you want the best for me. I know you hear and answer prayers. I know you're a sovereign, all-powerful God, and you're going to do what is best. The illustration, that means you might get an answer in five minutes and five seconds. It might be five days or five weeks. It may be three years. Continue to pray earnestly. And the last one is pray persistently. Continue to pray. You know, there are things that are happening in your life, things that are happening in my life, that are ongoing. I haven't seen a resolution. I haven't seen a resolution to these things that I keep giving to the Lord. But I have to give it to Him. I can't say his last name, but I think it's Denis Denisovich, Ivan Denisovich, in A Day in a Life, he writes about Alexander, uh, another author, with a, a Russian last name, writes about the horrors of the Soviet camp, and, and he was being seen praying by another prisoner, and he said, well, what are you praying? Are you praying that you get out of prison? He said, no, I'm praying that I do the will of God. Now, that's an amazing prayer in the situation that he finds himself in, and we can too. So I offer this prayer again, and God's not tired of my many words, but it's not my prayer that earns it. It's not my good deeds that get it. It's all the power of God that fulfills it. And so I conclude now asking you to join me in this prayer. God, my Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I know that you are the author and perfecter of my faith. I know that by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself will intercede on my behalf and answer this prayer as best for me. Thy will be done. I pray on behalf of my congregation and ask that you would lift it up and continue to make it a, a fortress against the evil. I ask that it would be a beacon of the community, definitely equipping, empowering, and sharing the love and hope of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would heal the hearts of those who are wounded, strengthen the families of those that feel that they are tottering, strengthen the marriages and the, the other relationships that seem to be on the verge of breakup. Continue to be our guard and our guide in all circumstances. Help me to be the pastor that you've called me to be and continue to improve and work in and through me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Work in and through parents as they raise children, as they continue to be parents to even grown children. I ask all this in the precious name of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. I can think of no better prayer than to start our time of prayer by singing the Lord's Prayer. It's a newer song to us. You may stand, sing along if you know it, and pray along from your hearts.
when we look at our lives and we look at the world and the storms that are gathered all around us, uh, many people are in despair. So that we now know who to turn to and who is speaking truly in and through us, the Holy Spirit. So we're going to pray for the church around the world. We're going to pray for our own church once again. And, and a lot of people that have just some various needs, would you pray for me? Lord, I lift up to you uh, the human powers that be in this world. The governments, uh, the organizations that lead and guide countries. I ask that you would enable them to uh, administer uh, good and, and right rules and order society within their borders that your peace would be made perfect and that you would work in and through them. Direct them to you, O oh Lord, for all the need and all the wisdom. Lord, I lift up to you the homeless, the forgotten, the oppressed, the unemployed, the disheartened, the sick, the suffering, and the grieving. Protect them, Lord. Defend them. Open doors and opportunities for them. Move them to rely on Jesus Christ for all their needs. I especially lift up to you, Melinda, and ask that what has gone wrong with the surgery that she that she had and, and the outcome, Lord, I ask that the uh, mighty power of healing would happen, I ask that whatever that you want to happen in her life would be, your will would be done, and that uh, your glory would be shown some way, somehow. I ask, Lord, that you would be with those who tend the flocks and till the soil, who provide transportation, who manage shops, who provide protection in communities and defense of our nation, who respond to emergencies, who work in the health and well-being of others. I ask that you would watch over them, guide and guard and protect them. Lord, I thank and praise you for all the wonderful blessings that you continue to give us, a family and friends, a place that we call the house of worship, a guiding statement that directs us to shine the light of Jesus to others. I thank you for that. I thank you for the gift of life. I thank you especially for Cora K, born just on the 21st, and, and mother and child are safe. And I do ask that you would continue to hold her in your care and raise her in, in, in the love and understanding of Jesus. I ask that you would be with us as we continue to offer our praises and thanks and, and, and give you honor and glory in all that we do and say. I pray this all in the strong and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And now you may be seated. Also at this time, we'll be presenting the Lord with gifts and offerings. And I believe we have a special musical offering that we're going to be hearing this morning. We have some people that are volunteered to sing Waymaker. I'm mm -hmm. 
We confess our faith in the Holy Spirit who intercedes for us. We say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth, and keeps it with Jesus Christ on true faith. In this Christian church he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. And on the last day he will raise me and all the dead, and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. A prayer of preparation as we prepare our hearts to receive that which comes to us in the bread and the wine, the very body and blood, when the word of God is spoken over them. Lord God, we come to you, and we know that it is right to give you thanks all the time, because you, Lord, through your Son's death and resurrection, have promised the grace to hear all of our prayers, all the way until the coming time of harvest. We ask that you would gratefully and, and faithfully help us to eat the body and blood and, and as he bids us do. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate always the faithful with the faithful, the marriage feast of the Lamb and His kingdom, which has no end. Continue to receive our prayers and deliver us. To you alone, we have glory, honor, praise, and worship. One God, now and always. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it. He gave it to His disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. The way he gave thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As you have prepared your hearts and minds, welcome to the Lord's table. Go ahead and have everybody come up. Uh, we just need to get Bob up here first. <laughs> I saw the 
so that we will always serve you and have full faith and assurance in your loving promises now and always. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Well, the blessing of the Almighty Father, who has adopted you as his own children, the Son who has given his life to you, for you, and the Holy Spirit who brings your groanings and your signs, your prayers to the throne of glory, bless you and keep you. May his peace rest upon you and be gracious to you. Go now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Rejoice and be glad. You are the children of God.
Father, a word of prayer. God, I ask that you would bless our gathering today as we gather together in fellowship and fun and enjoy the barbecue and those that we give you thanks to those who worked it and did it. We ask that whatever happens over there, of course, will be according to your will. Bless the food and nurture to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. Hope to see you.